Yep. It's the day you've been waiting for. No, not St. Patrick's Day. Yes. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Let's get that out of the way. You know, enjoy. Your, knock yourself out, peeps. No, it's Thursday. Dan Nathan, not here. It's G Swizz and EY from SoFi. I mean, we're going to sort of take this over. By the way, we got Blueford Putnam, chief economist at CME Group. He's going to be here in a few minutes to give his take on yesterday's Fed announcement. And yes, you know what you're watching. It's Thursday, March 17th, the aforementioned St. Patrick's Day. I'm Guy Adami, joined by Liz Young from SoFi. Today's episode brought to you by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. SoFi, Liz, get your money right and all in one app and open exchange because they do, in fact, manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. Get your bingo cards out. Put 30 minutes on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> EY from SoFi, how are oh, you? I'm good. I brought you something. No, Just... stop. Oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness I heard gracious. how much you love it. So I'm just going to do the opener with this on. Please. I mean, <laughs> it is. Um, okay. Yeah. okay. Well, okay, look, okay. no, it's all good. I mean, it's all good. I mean, let's get it out of our systems. I see you got the <laughs> rock in the green, as they say. I'm not doing that. But how are you? Listen, a lot's I'm happened good. over the last 24, less than 24 hours. A lot. A lot has happened. Well, some of it we expected to happen, right? But the market reaction, I think, is maybe more of the surprise. And what we heard out of the Fed about what they think is going to happen for the next 12 to 24 months was also a bit of a surprise. So when you think about, first of all, the horse is out of the barn, right? Oh. We got We got that out of the way. It's done. We raised rates and we raised them by exactly as much as we thought we would. But the conversation afterwards was honestly a little bit fearful that inflation is out of control and that they're going to have to use more muscle in order to get it back into control. I still haven't completely figured out what it means for the Fed to say that the Fed funds rate is going to be at 2.8% in 2023 and 2024, and the long run rate is 2.4%. Does that mean that they're going to they're going to have to cut? Does that mean that they're going to have to use a bunch of muscle and it's going to work? I haven't figured out how that's going to figure itself I don't think, out. I don't think they figured it out either. Interesting you mentioned the conversation. Of course, I know you know this. The great John Cazale was in five movies in a seven-year period. All five movies were nominated <laughs> for Best Picture, but Conversation with Gene Hackman being one of them. I know you know that. I digress course, a bit here. Yeah. But we're having a conversation right now. And I got to tell you something. I love this wheels up. I mean... I love what you're doing here. By the way, a great private aviation company, but that's neither here nor there. Can we stick the landing? Can they carry Strug this landing? And I'm telling you, they got no shot. But I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Well, I want to know what you think is going to happen if they don't stick the landing, because I actually defined it as we might have a shallow recession. The thing about that is you have a shallow recession it fixes the inflation problem. You don't find out that you had a shallow recession until it's over. So maybe mm -hmm. it shakes the tree a little bit, right? Inflation comes down. Because also we have to remember the inflation problem is only going to get fixed if demand relaxes a little. Because there's supply in the system. Yes, we still have bottlenecks, but even that isn't going to last forever. It's demand that the Fed is going to have to affect, right? So if you have a shallow recession that slows people down, and we're already seeing a big hit to consumer confidence, if it slows people down and demand comes off these high levels, you see things like oil come down, maybe people make different decisions about their travel season, then it might not be a bad thing. I think the worst thing would be if inflation stays high and we make a mistake like we did in the 70s and try not to go into a recession. So I'm not calling for a recession. I'm not saying that we should. I'm not saying I'm not, you know, you rah, rah recession. I think everybody gets really afraid of that, but I'm saying it's possible. And I think that the possibility of it has risen since yesterday at 1.59 p.m. Yeah, well, you know, Steve Miller Band is from your home state of Wisconsin. And one of the lines was, oh, you don't want to shake your tree. And, and I think we should be. <laughs> shaking some trees here but it's interesting you mentioned recession and i have my thoughts on this i'm curious to yours people view recession as a four-letter word i don't yeah. i think it's a natural and essential part of the business cycle and the fact that we've tried to uh, avoid these for so many years just makes the inevitable that much worse if they just allow it to happen and the system to correct itself i think we'd all be better off yep so the cause of a recession matters right 
Think back to 2008, 2009, the cause of the recession was excessive risk-taking in a certain part of the market. That's why it was so difficult for the market to correct it. Think back to 2020, the cause of the recession was a completely exogenous shock, had nothing to do with the market or economy, but the effect was on the economy. And we bounced back pretty quickly. If in this case, the cause of the recession is inflation and we need the recession in order to control it, I think that we can come back from it pretty well. And we'd come back from it in a place where the consumer is still willing to spend. Hopefully it doesn't break the labor market. And we can find out that, okay, now we just trudge along maybe at a little bit of a slower pace for a while, but it doesn't kill us. And I agree, it's a totally normal part of the cycle. It's interesting you say pick your poison. I've actually pitched that to uh, CNBC Fast Money producers as a segment, you know, sort of that Iocane huh. powder for you uh, Princess Bride fans or, you know, Hemlock for you Shakespeare fans. It doesn't matter. But yeah, you have to effectively at this point pick your poison. And I would, listen, I'd rather have slower economic growth and continued market volatility instead of this inflation problem, which is a huge problem, EY. Yep, yep. It is. It's a problem because, as we all know, the consumer is 70% of our economy. If inflation breaks the consumer, the economy breaks. Then we're in a recession regardless. So there's really no point in trying to avoid recession at all costs and leave inflation where it is. You leave inflation where it is, we'll end up in a recession that's even worse because then the consumer can't bounce back. So I guarantee, we have I'm to sorry. attack this. Yes, absolutely. I was just to say, I guarantee none of you suckers had princess bride or iocane powder on your bingo cards but hey that's why we play the game <laughs> let's take let's take a look at the s p 500 because again you know we've looked at this i know listen, i know you don't want to get in the weeds in terms of technicals and charts but lower left to the upper right since obviously you know that huge downturn in march april of 2020 we all know it but it's a very well-defined uptrend it stopped it changed course late November, December, when obviously the Fed changed course. And I think this change of direction is really important. People will look at this as sort of a um, death cross, as they say, the 50-day crossing through the 200-day. We've had a couple decent days of bounces. I guess my question to you is, and you were the one that started talking about this in early December, we've gone, in your opinion, and I agree, we've gone from a buy-the-dip market to a sell-the-rally market. And these rallies in down markets, I don't want to say bear markets, typically are extraordinarily violent. I think that's what we saw mm -hmm. yesterday. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, you know, and I think actually the mentality is starting to shift again, but it's only shifting in certain sectors. So if I were to tell people, let's say we rewind two weeks, if somebody asked me, okay, what would you be selling the rally in? I would say I'd start selling the rally in energy here because at some point that's going to calm down too. Right now, I think if you're overexposed to things that are going to be sensitive to growth, not necessarily financials, but you think about cyclical sectors that are overly sensitive to growth. So some things like industrials, maybe even materials, maybe you sell the rallies in some of those. But I think that actually this is a time, and I started talking about this too about a month ago, you got to wait for the first hike to happen. Then you can start to leg back into technology, but manage your own expectations because some of that volatility that we've seen in tech, absent a recession, a 20% flush on the NASDAQ is pretty good. So you see a 20% flush on a broad market benchmark across tech, right? No recession has happened yet. And this is a time where you see it start to stabilize, not like produce double digit positive returns, but it stabilizes and it starts to stabilize six to 12 months out from that first hike. So I actually think this is a time when you can start to leg back into tech, wait for it a little bit, don't get too antsy, and start to position yourself for what's going to happen maybe in the next 8 to 12 months. Yeah, I agree with that. We're going to skip past the NDX chart quickly because it's very similar to the S&P chart. I will say you have a very well-defined death cross here. But let's take a look yeah. at yields because i got to tell you something. I mean, the volatility in 10-year yields for the last almost a year to me has been extraordinary. And it speaks, I don't know, I don't think it augurs particularly well for equity markets long term. But that's just me. But there's no way, in my opinion, over the last couple of weeks, 10-year yield should go from 205 down to 168, back to 215, all while the 210s continues to narrow. I think it speaks to something far more nefarious than just uh, rates going higher because of robust economic growth. 
Yeah, I agree. And, and I don't like where the spread is right now. It was at about 21 basis points last time I looked. That's dangerously close to inverting. And we talked about this last week, I think, what actually counts as an inversion. So maybe if it inverts intraday or it inverts for a few days, it doesn't necessarily count as that recession signal, but it's not going to make anybody feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. So if that happens, we're still going to have trepidation in the market. We're still going to have these days where the market can't figure out which direction to go. And remember, we've got, we had the Fed meeting yesterday, but we don't have another one until May. There's a lot of stuff that could happen between now and then, and we still have a war going on. So I think that there is a lot of volatility still to be seen in the treasury market. But I also think that you have to imagine almost an artificial top on the 10 year, right? So the Fed has told us now, we think the Fed funds rate will be 2.8% in 2023. That tells me that the 10 year probably can't get above. I don't know, two and a quarter, two and a half comfortably before something happens. So I think even though if there's going to be volatility, it can't shoot all the way up above about two and a half percent. Yeah, I agree with you. It's interesting. People say warm and fuzzy. You just throw that out there. I mean, the warm part's <laughs> fine. I mean, warm and fuzzy on the inside. The fuzzy part to me, that's, I don't know, it just doesn't <laughs> sort of sit well with me. I mean, maybe it's those Chipotle burritos I've been eating, but that's for another show. No question about it. Uh, please continue to fill out your cards. When I was a kid, by the way, one of my favorite movies was Walking Tall. I don't know if you ever remember that. You probably never saw it. But the, the protagonist in that movie, great word, by the way, was Buford T. Pusser. Well, we're going to introduce for the first time here on Market Call, Bluford Putnam, not Buford, Bluford Putnam, Managing Director and Chief Economist at CME Group. Now, my sense is he's saying to himself, why did I agree to do this? And hey, brother, that's your problem. But you did agree, and you're here with us now. How are you, Blue? I'm doing fine, and I am Blueford. No Buford for me. Now, I hear you, and that's why I made the distinction. You notice the diction in my voice, very important. Another great word for your bingo card. So look, you're taking a look at the Fed. you got some key takeaways. Um, I just want you to know, prior to this conversation, and I've said it, I've written about it, I am no fan. I have said publicly that I think amongst the villains of the 21st century, of which there are many, central bankers will be at the top of the list. So with that sort of in the back of your mind, talk to me about this Fed meeting yesterday. Wow. You know, that's in the back of my mind. My first job out of graduate school, you know, I got my PhD. I didn't know anything about the world. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York hired me. I didn't stay there too long. But anyway, that's just uh, to put the biases into context. So what did the Fed do? You know, what did Jay Powell really say yesterday? He said, one, forward guidance is dead. Every meeting is live. You know, we're data dependent, which they probably should be. But anyway, forward guidance is gonna fade into the background. Then he said, you know, you know what about the balance sheet? It's gonna get smaller. Yeah, I'm not gonna let you uh, click that bingo card, by the way. Uh, anyway. <laughs> The, uh, you know, he, uh, he attributed buying, uh, you know, the asset holdings of the Fed uh, to the same thing as, uh, you know, raising rates. And I don't agree with that. I mean, you know, raising rates from zero, a quarter point, a couple of times, these are pretty small. That's going to help the economy. I mean, retirees haven't been getting anything off their fixed income, their cash. You know, money market funds have to deal with all this. The economy is going to function better when rates mm -hmm. get to one or two. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, what uh, this, uh, you know, the balance sheet is really what some people call QT, uh, quantitative tightening. That's all about equity volatility and bond volatility, which I believe, you know, if they really do uh, manage this, then, you know, we're going to see more volatility in equities and bonds. And then my third takeaway was the way he talked about labor markets. Jay Powell put a ton of influence on how robust and healthy the current labor markets are. But I got to tell you, these things can change quickly. I'm not forecasting that. I'm just saying what the Fed said was that we're going to keep raising rates as long as the labor market's strong. But if the labor market backs off, hey, we might too. So, you know, we, you know, the Fed's data dependent. By the way, that's not a criticism. If the Fed weren't data dependent, it would be forecasting. It'd be half wrong half the time. We don't want that. I, you know, it's better off if they're three to six months late than if they're getting things wrong all the time. So not a criticism, just a reality. So those, those no, are my three. 
Yes. No, it's fair enough. And listen, I mean, I, you make a great point. And again, I, I'm not suggesting these are not, they're extraordinarily smart individuals, predominantly men. So I'll say guys, but without question, I will tell you, and I think you would agree with this, their track record at forecasting things um, is not particularly robust. I mean, none of us are. But the fact though, and this is my biggest concern, you know, the fact that I believe, and I'm curious as to your thoughts, that they've become slaves to the market. I understand this dual mandate thing, and I've said it on television, I'll say it to you, and I say this half in jest. I think their dual mandate is making sure the S&P 500, the NASDAQ goes up every day. And under those guidelines, they've done an extraordinary job over the last 13 years. Well, they certainly did over the last 13 years. And, and you go back to Alan Greenspan, who talked about uh, exuberant markets and equities in the 1990s. But I don't think this Fed is uh, quite in that direction. I, I think that the, uh, the various issues the Fed had with the trading of uh, Board of Governors members and Fed presidents, you know, they're, they're going to be a little more cautious on what they do with equities and focus more on the real economy. And by the way, you know, when once a uh, these appointments are approved. Uh, even you know, we'll see what happens with the with the latest appointments. But you know, there's going to be a lot of women on that Federal Reserve Board. You better be careful. Is that foreshadowing? Do you think I'll get tapped? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I'm available. Better I'm you available. than me, you know. <laughs> yeah, I said I. I have a question. Let's. I want to go back to your statement about rate hikes not being the same as as balance sheet. My impression, and you can tell me I'm wrong because you probably understand this much better than I do. My impression is that they will continue to raise rates gently, so 25 basis points every meeting, because that's what the market is expecting, and they don't want to scare the market. So to Guy's point, scaring the market is a big no-no, right? So they don't want to scare the market with something like 50 basis points. So they'll keep raising rates gently at 25 apiece, and then use the balance sheet when they need to manipulate the yield curve. So let's say the curve inverts or it stays this flat. Then they start using the balance sheet and they say something along the lines of, we have to be more aggressive with balance sheet runoff this time, which is gonna tell us they're gonna engage in outright selling, right? And then they manipulate maybe the long end of the curve to go up. Is that reasonable? And how would that affect equity markets? Yeah, that's totally reasonable. If you can put the chart of the tenure up while you're at it, uh, you know, what, what, what I think the Fed really uh, doesn't want to do is they do not want to invert the twos tens. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're okay close, but as you pointed out, we're only 20 basis points away. So uh, if the Fed uh, doesn't purchase as many bonds or actually, you know, well, they don't, sell, but they'll let them run off. The Fed doesn't know how to sell, but they do know let, how to re let assets run off. If they let that balance sheet be as smaller than it used to be, you know, then, then that's going to impact uh, bond yields, and that'll impact both bond and equity volatility. And I don't think they're, uh, they're going to be upset with that because they would like, uh, you know, if I interpret what you said, you can reinterpret it. But, you know, the 10 year is looking like a cap on how high they can raise rates. And if the, so if the 10 year goes up a little bit, that's not a problem, you know, if I interpret the Fed that way. Blueford, um, I remember it was kind of four years ago, maybe, I think the Fed's balance sheet was four and a half trillion dollars. And I found it to just be outrageous. You just mentioned it's nine trillion. And by the way, um, you know, I think unless I'm mistaken, it seems to, unless I'm, unless I'm missing something, they're still doing asset purchases unless they stopped on a dime. With that said, Given this economy, given money, so all those things that you know a lot more about than I do, what should the balance sheet be? It's probably not four and a half trillion now, given the size of the economy. It certainly shouldn't be nine. My sense is it should be closer to six, six and a half. Is that about right? Probably not. Uh, you know, I don't know what the balance sheet should be. But, you know, the, the thing is that the, the expansion of the balance sheet depends a lot on exactly what they buy. And if they're buying treasuries and mortgages, that doesn't affect what you and I consume. It doesn't affect anything in the real economy. The only time the Fed expansion of the balance sheet was really a positive event was back in 2008 when they bought toxic waste, otherwise known as distressed securities, and they helped the U.S. economy recover faster from 2008. So, you know, I don't know what the right balance sheet size is, but I do know that quantitative easing uh, simply supports equity markets and does nothing for the real economy. 
Blue, I appreciate you joining us. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, tell Terry you have a good time, and I hope you'll join us again. I want to say thank you to Blue Putnam, chief economist at CME Group. And by the way, Blue, I know you know this, one of the great movies, Jessica Lange, Dennis Quaid, everybody's all American. <laughs> of course, you remember the scene where Dennis Quaid did a sprint with a guy named Blue. So anyway, I digress once again, and I guarantee <laughs> people that wasn't on your bingo card. So Blue, thanks for I gotta for see these again. bingo cards. <laughs> bingo, let me tell you, MKT, it's taken off, man. Go to your local <laughs> Dollar Gen, you can get all you want anyway. EY, stick around with me because we got to talk about energy. You had a tremendous call on yeah. energy at the back half of last year. We talked about energy, I think, last week. Looked like it could be a bit of a blow off top. This is obviously the OIH uh, comprised mostly of Schlumberger, Halliburton, to a lesser extent, Baker Hughes. That's about 50% of the CTF. We had talked about 245, the level of resistance. When it got through there, we thought it easily could get to 285, 300. It overshot. But here we are now. So, you know, we're talking about energy. Personally, I don't think it's over. I think that was a bit of a blow off top. But I think we're in the early innings. We're, not, we're in the mid innings of this thing. What are your thoughts on energy right here? Well, I think because of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, and I've got another gift for you, Guy. You oh, watched. no. Go ahead. Most people's, it... most people's calls on energy have been nothing but this, which is lucky. And we can't foresee the shocks that are going to happen, right? I said to my analyst, I don't know, sometime in January, we're just one shock away from triple digit oil. And I turned out to be right. I didn't know what the shock was going to be. I didn't know how quickly it was going to be over. And it, it wasn't, the shock isn't over, but energy fell down back under triple digits. So thoughts on the sector as a whole, because demand is still strong in the economy and around the globe for energy, it's probably going to stay at an elevated level for a while. But I'm not in the game of trying to trade in and out of that on mm -hmm. a weekly basis because I know I'm going to screw it up. So I feel like the level that we got to, especially on oil a couple weeks ago, was about as good as it was going to get, about as high as it was going to get without breaking the economy. So that's why I said when I was talking about selling rips, that's why I started to sell rips. And I thought about, all right, you know what? I want to get out of this because if it goes higher than this, it starts to break the consumer. And then I don't want to be in it when it Geronimo's back down. I think that's exactly right. I love that you brought props to this week's market call. I mean, that's, I mean, it's just so good. Somewhere Dan is just, just rolling his eyes, no doubt. But I'm with you. I, listen, I think there are a couple more chapters left in this energy. I think we bounce off 245 in the OIH. If you're looking to trade it, you trade it around that level and look for another bounce to the upside. We'll see. Uh, Mike Mayo, I know you're familiar with that name, great mm -hmm. bank analyst. Uh, making some calls on Bank of America. Rate hikes will boost Bank of America's profits. And you know what? That makes sense. And I love Mike Mayo. He's raising his full year earnings per share to come in at 345. That's a bit of a tweak, if nothing else. I think the average price target on BAC is $51.50 thereabout. Um, banks are interesting here. And I'm not looking to play stock market with you because I know that's what you do. But what do you think about the financials? I mean, you can make a bull case for them, and you can make a really cogent bear case at the exact same time. Yep, and I'm going to choose bull. And I made this case on TV on Scott Wapner's new show the other day. When you think about financials, particularly banks and ones that are exposed to the consumer, you have to think about how they make money and how they make money at different parts of the cycle. So we know that the Fed is going to keep raising rates, right? It's not just about the 10-year treasury. It's about where the Fed funds rate is, and then as a result, where the prime rate is. And if we know that rates are gonna keep going up, first of all, banks make money on things that are gonna be variable rate, right? So as rates are rising, if they're trying to lend in a variable rate environment, they're gonna make money as rates go up. If they're lending money on things like personal loans, the rate that they offer on a personal loan is a lot higher than the rate that they offer on a 30-year mortgage. So they're making more spread on that too. And if we get later into the cycle and the consumer starts to get pinched, you're going to see more personal loans. You're going to see less mortgages. And I don't know if anybody noticed, but mortgage rates on average went above 4% today. There's been a huge spike in mortgage rates. So you'd expect some mortgage lending to slow down and some of the other kinds of lending to speed up things like credit cards, personal loans, maybe even auto loans. And those are higher rate, higher margin businesses for banks to be in. So I'm still bullish on banks here. Uh, I'm bullish on financials as a whole, because also if we have volatility in the market that continues through the year, you want the ones that are going to benefit from trading activity too. I don't think people are exiting their trading activity hobby anytime soon. 
No, I agree with that. And you just answered Jay's question, who is uh, tweeting to our crack executive producer, Amanda Diaz. Quick question for you, again, off topic. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is today, obviously, a Thursday, which is probably about the best day it could possibly be on outside of a Saturday, is my sense. Thursday night, people go out anyway. So I've never had a Guinness in my life. I've tasted one. I, I, I just can't. But would you be enjoying a Guinness or a whiskey? Well, um, I actually have one more prop. I, I didn't think I'd have time oh, to use. Oh, please, then, then, then bring it in. <laughs> a Guinness in a bottle. It's, it's closed because the market's still open and I can't give investment advice under the influence. But I love a Guinness. I also love whiskey ginger. So, and I am going out tonight. <laughs> so, ch chances so I are... It'll be at least one boxes. of each. Yeah, at least one of each. I'm not sure which order yet, but at least one of each. I promise you. No, I might start please, with this one at four o'clock. Please put it in your Twitter feed. <laughs> what do they call that? A, a Twitter a, a feed or when they do a bunch of Twitter things in a row? Dan knows thread. All they call it a thread. a thread. A thread. A thread. Yeah. A thread. Please thread that for later. <laughs> uh, before we Audi 5000 here, we got to take a look at FedEx. Um, we got FedEx earnings after the bell. And I got to tell you something. I, I'm wrong all the time. Well, FedEx has been one I could not be more wrong about. I thought at $285, $300, it was there, I don't know, six or nine months ago, coming off an extraordinary quarter, in my opinion. I thought FedEx had figured it all out. You can make a really compelling case for FedEx on valuation, all those things. And it's just been a brutal stock, as this chart uh, clearly shows. I mean, it's been a really hard one to own for a while. And you can talk about valuation all you want. doesn't seem to matter with FedEx. Clearly, it doesn't matter with UPS, which is a more expensive stock. But for FedEx, I don't know what the bull case is at this point. I, I know you like to, again, just talking about the transports. Yeah. What's the backdrop now for the transports, in your opinion? How do they sort of uh, stack up in this environment? Well, I mean, as you know, we usually look at the transports as an indicator of economic activity. And you can, you can think about it as an indicator of motion around the economy, how quickly goods are moving. I think in the near term, transports are probably okay. But as we get further in the year and we've got the Fed hiking three, four times by then and growth is slowing, the concerns are gonna mount. And then you start to have growth concerns and you start to have demand concerns. And I would watch things like consumer confidence, consumer spending. And if that starts to really stay at a lower level, then the transports are not the place you wanna be. I agree with you. And Rick Manicos, as you know, was a great college basketball player. I think he went to the University <laughs> of Indiana of course, uh, I know, you know everything about him. Yeah, nobody had. <laughs> and once again, there are a lot of there are a lot of people just dropping like this, saying, "Beep!" I didn't have that on my bingo card. But what I guarantee all you suckers had is butters. So put that little chalk mark on your card because here we are, one for the road. Three hundred and fifty-eight of the seven five hundred companies, and so that's a little over seventy percent. See, I can do that math cited supply chain on their fourth quarter earnings call. That, that's the second highest number going back 10 years. That's pretty extraordinary. Industrials and technology, obviously the higher numbers. What's your sense? Are we through this supply chain thing or is this still a problem for the next couple quarters? Well, obviously what's going on in Russia, Ukraine hasn't helped anything. I think that we're through the supply chain, the big bottlenecks that we had in the US. And at this point, because demand is still so strong, we just can't meet it yet. But at some point, there's going to be a buildup in inventory, and we will have a relaxation in this. I think that the, the worst of it is behind us. Well, now we're going to do all three props at once. So stay with me. We didn't oh rehearse gosh. this. No. I hope all you folks can see <laughs> how lucky you are <laughs> to have EY here to talk about all the bottlenecks that exist. <laughs> <laughs> In Dan is going to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, folks. That's um, 30 minutes. That's going to do it for today's market call. Want to thank our sponsors, FactSet, SoFi, <laughs> and Open Exchange. And I got to tell you, if we rehearse that, it couldn't have gone any better. For more great content from EY, follow her on Twitter at Liz Young Strat <laughs> and sign up for SoFi's daily newsletter at SoFi.com slash daily. Last week I said backslash. I was corrected. It's a slash to read Liz's articles every Thursday. I want to thank Blue as well from the CME group. Check us out on Monday. We'll be back and 
much to my chagrin, Dan Nathan <laughs> will be back to chastise me. Talk to you later. <laughs>